To say that things were chaotic as the U.S. was preparing to end its 20-year presence on the ground in Afghanistan would be an understatement. There was chaos at the airport. A suicide bombing killed dozens, including 13 U.S. troops. People were afraid. Then on August 29th, as the deadline to be out of the country approached, there was a drone strike that the Pentagon claims was ISIS-K. Is that true, though? Matthew Akins, journalist for The New York Times and author of the upcoming book, The Naked, Don't Fear the Water, is on the ground in Kabul and joins us now to dig into it. Matthew, welcome. Thank you for having me. You bet. I want to get right to this situation on the ground. Um, Tell us exactly what happened on August 29th. Well, the U.S. military carried out a drone strike inside the capital, Kabul, and they said that it was against an ISIS target. They said they'd killed an ISIS facilitator who would pose an imminent threat to the airport. I can confirm as more information has come in that two high profile ISIS targets were killed and one was wounded. And we know of zero civilian casualties. So the next day um, I went there to the site with a photographer for the Times, Jim Hollybrook. And we got to the, the courtyard of this house where the strike had taken place. They'd hit a car. And there was the family that this house belonged to who were just completely heartbroken. Until they had lost 10 members of their family, including seven children. So right away, it was apparent that there had been civilian casualties in this airstrike. But, you know, over the following weeks, as we pieced together the story, did our investigation on the ground, you know, with a great team in New York, that uh, was putting together visual forensics, became apparent that this story didn't really add up. You know, the guy who had been targeted, Zemrai Ahmadi, and who was killed in the strike, he was a longtime aid worker with a California-based company, Nutrition and Education International, that was doing humanitarian aid. And what the U.S. military had said, you know, were a suspicious series of moves, just turned out to be, according to his co-workers, a regular day at work your team, when they pieced together that video using the security footage of the car, the driver from the courtyard, where it was parked along the route it drove that day, give us a sense of what you see and what's crystal clear in that video. Yeah, well, what you see in the video that we put together is a kind of timeline of events and we have the locations that we established by multiple interviews with his co-workers, with his family, about where he went, when, you know, what houses he stopped at on his way to work. And then at work, we had the actual security camera footage. I went to the office and got it, and there's multiple cameras, so you can see him pulling up, getting out of the car with his co-workers, walking inside, smiling, waving at the cleaner, you know, typical day at the office, filling up these water cans. Uh, We've also gotten video of him, you know, he's an engineer working in the soybean factories that this company was setting up, giving out food to kids in the same car that was destroyed. Photos of him and his family, of his um, beautiful children who were killed in the strike. So all of that is there and together I think it presents a, a case that this was the wrong target. Is there any way, based on who you've spoken to on the ground there in Afghanistan, any way to sort of misinterpret or or understand how the U.S. military might have thought there was some sort of ISIS-K involvement? Well, there was definitely an active threat to the airport. You you have to remember that just three days before, there had been this horrendous suicide attack that killed almost 200 people, 13 of them U.S. troops. And the very next day after the drone strike, there was a rocket attack from the same neighborhood using a similar car. So the U.S. military was definitely aware of threats. They were probably getting a lot of intelligence that indicates something was going to happen. But, you know, they really have to be careful with these kind of strikes because they are devastating. They took this strike inside a crowded residential neighborhood, and the end result is that you have 10 people who apparently have no connection to ISIS who are dead. I want to play for you what the Pentagon has said so far as well. As we know from a variety of other means, that at least one of those people that were killed was a ISIS facilitator. Uh, so were there others killed? Yes, there are others killed. Who they are, we don't know. Uh, we'll try to sort through all that. Uh, but we believe that the procedures at this point, I don't want to influence the outcome of an investigation, um, but at this point we think that the procedures were correctly followed and it was a righteous strike. A righteous strike. What do you say to that? 
Well, I think that a strike that killed seven children can't be called righteous by anyone's standards. And the fact of the matter is, is that the military gives this version of events and they tend to stick to it unless they're challenged by alternate evidence. In this case, we were able to develop very powerful contradicting evidence and testimony on the ground in Kabul, but we had to think how many other strikes there are like this where it's just the official version of events that doesn't get challenged. The Costs of War Project at Brown University's Watson Institute for International Public Affairs estimates that 46,000 Afghan civilians were killed since the U.S. launched its war in Afghanistan. That's 15 times more than the number of Americans who died on 9-11. What's your takeaway from that number? Well, I think it's a number of people who have gone mostly unmourned, and it's people whose names and faces we don't know. And that's why I think it's important to know about these victims. So Matthew, how can the U.S. have any level of confidence in intelligence gathering without having U.S. troops on the ground and many uh, of the people that they trusted, there were so many people who have been evacuated out of the country. Yeah, I think that their capacity has taken a huge hit. Um, you know, one possible area of cooperation with the Taliban would be on counterterrorism issues. I think that now the Tal- that the Taliban are a government, they're going to have less incentive to tolerate or even work with groups like Al Qaeda. Um, they've been fighting against ISIS, so. It's a big if, but if the U.S. can, uh, you know, incentivize the Taliban and try to reform and cooperate on counterterrorism, then that could perhaps replace some of that lost capability. So you spent so much time in Afghanistan, right, over a decade. What are you watching in the coming weeks? I think we're watching to see, first of all, if there can be a effective response and cooperation between the Taliban and the international community for the financial crisis, for the humanitarian crisis, you know, people don't have enough to eat, salaries have been frozen, Um, we're worried about a currency crash, the banks, you know, if you go to a bank now, you see long lines of people lined up because they can only take out about $200 every, um, for a fixed period. So that's the immediate problem. And then there's also whether the Taliban, which have announced an acting cabinet that was very narrow, very much about their own core conservative membership, Um, whether they're going to follow through on their promises to expand that, to bring in other parts of Afghan society to govern, you know, and and what they are going to bring about what they call an Islamic system. It's not going to be a democracy. Now that the U.S. has fully pulled out, what would you say to the Biden White House about the future of Afghanistan? I would say that, you know, we need to be pragmatic while still being steadfast in our support for for rights for Afghan women, you know, who are facing a particularly difficult situation. Um, But at the same time, we shouldn't act out of revenge. If you look at the situations in Iran or Cuba, where decades of sanctions have only compounded both the repressiveness of regimes and suffering the people, clearly that's not the way forward for Afghanistan. So I'm hopeful that points of cooperation, like humanitarian aid, like basic governance, like trying to push for more inclusive uh, government, could offer us a way forward out of that. Matt Akins, journalist for The New York Times, joining us from Kabul. Matt, thank you so much. It's my pleasure.